Welcome to the Adventure Pro Podcast. Interviews, stories and inspiration from amazing people that have made adventure their business. So today's guest on the podcast has led a very varied uh, career with both in the outdoor arena and uh, with environmental roles too. He's a keen mountain biker, conservationist and general outdoors enthusiast based in North Wales. Today's guest is Tom Johnston. Tom, welcome to the podcast. Uh, would you like to give us uh, an overview of what, what you're currently up to within the um, within the industries that you work in? Hi, Tom. Thanks very much for having me. So at the moment, I am run, still running my mountain bike guiding business that I've run for the last decade, but I have scaled that back a little bit and taken on a full-time role working in climate change, green infrastructure and natural flood management for one of the local authorities in North Wales, um, focusing specifically within one of the areas of outstanding natural beauty. So uh, I still get to do some biking trips, but I'm, I'm a little bit lucky now that I get to cherry, cherry pick the mountain bike work that I want to do. And I get to work on a more climate change focused role Monday to Friday. Well, that sounds great. There's lots to dig into there. So, with the with your mountain bike, just give us uh, let's have a little plug here. What what what's the what's your company called? So I started a company called Carbon Monkey uh, back in 2010, and my business has varied over the years, but it predominantly focuses around bespoke mountain bike skills coaching, guiding, uh, bike packing trips, and a little bit of road and gravel. Um, but it's it's much more focused around doing bespoke stuff for for people who are after a, a particular something different. Oh, great! So, how does that work then with regards to a bespoke trip? Because I, I run cycling trips myself, um, and it's it's really good to have people come and say, "Oh, I've got a group; they want to do this trip." Is that the sort of same approach that you have, um, and and how do you sort of get your business out there? Yeah, I have a very flexible approach to the bespoke trips that I run. So um, as an example, I was approached a couple of years ago by uh, a client who wanted to do a Paris to Bordeaux road bike trip. And they already knew exactly what trip they wanted to do it, when they wanted to go, where they were going to stay. They'd done all of the trip planning themselves, but they needed somebody to help facilitate the trip and move their bikes out to France, move their bags between hotels, be a mechanic who was on call if they had a major failure, that sort of thing. And yeah, I was I was totally up for doing that. It was a lovely, lovely, lovely five um, and pretty low key. But yeah. then on the opposite end of the scale, I've got a, a group of guys who have come back to me probably on their seventh or eighth trip now, and they will just ping me a, a date of a weekend that they want to get together and ride bikes somewhere in the UK. And typically we will always, those guys will always do either road or gravel, but we're getting a little bit more adventurous as the years roll on. And then it's all up to me. So I can put a couple of suggestions to them about, you know, we could go here and go bothy to bothy, or we could go here and go hotel to hotel. And I'll pitch a couple of ideas and they'll they'll go, that's the one we want to do. And then I'll I'll put it all together for them. That sounds great, wonderful. And you, you say you do some bike packing trips as well. So are they are they self supported? Then you you sort of go off into the wilds just just with a group, or do you do you um, coordinate it so you can get a vehicle in as well to the to the groups? Typically, with the bike packing stuff that I do, we'll go we'll go properly self supported um, and and off grid. Um, I've been doing bike packing trips with clients for quite a number of years now, um, probably just about since before bike packing was a, a term um, yeah. that was really used, <laughs> um, you know, back when it was just multi-day mountain biking. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, I will do that for my own private clients, but I have also done that for, for other people who know that they need a specialist who's got both the mountain bike and the, the multi-day sort of backcountry skills. So I've done a lot of um, a lot of expedition work for the Ministry of Defence on their programmes, and I've worked for other guides and, and plenty of other folks in the industry who go, 
oh, we need somebody a bit bike packy here. Who who's who's in that avenue? Oh, yeah. Tommy, let's give him a call. Oh, brilliant. So yeah. Oh, great stuff. And, and and is it? Have you always done biking stuff, or you just a gen? I know that you're a sort of general outdoors um, enthusiast, but what what made you focus down and, and drill down onto bikes I- instead of other aspects? Yeah, so I started mountain biking when I was eleven. Um, started climbing and paddling, similar sort of time. You know, I grew up in an outdoorsy family in North Wales. I was I was very slow to get into the industry. I didn't realise it was a, a career option. Uh, the careers advisor kept you know suggesting I became an architect or a graphic designer or something, <laughs> and and I stumbled into the outdoor game by mistake. Um, and you know I I did a BTEC course and then a, a uh, an undergrad degree in outdoor and environmental education. So that was sort of the early two thousands, and there was very very little money in mountain biking or cycling um, as a guide back then so if you wanted to earn your bread and butter you needed to be a mountain leader a paddle sports leader climbing instructor and so I became a real jack of all trades and uh, freelanced and worked in centres but it was always the mountain biking you know the mountain bike was what I went to on my days off and if there was ever mountain biking on the um on the activity list for the week that was what I was chomping at the bit to get onto and so I just pushed it as my own avenue of interest really yeah. and uh, you know I, I got qualified and um, you know I'm, I'm level three mountain bike leader I've done the night the winter the exped the bike mechanics the British cycling courses all of it and I was investing huge amounts of time and money into those qualifications and constantly being told you're doing this because you want to, not because you're going to earn any money. Right. And, you know, (laughs) certainly for the first probably 10 years of being a mountain bike guide, I spent more money on qualifications than I earned. Um, But it did mean that ultimately I got to this tipping point where suddenly I was one of the go to guides in the country in terms of experience and qualification. And it took a very long time to get there. But when it did get there, then I got fantastic work being offered to me and finally started to recoup a little bit of the cost I'd invested. <laughs> so do, do you think that w- that was a, a tipping point then? Can you can you actually pinpoint a time in your career where, you know, you'd gone through all those qualifications, you'd, you'd gained all the experience and then suddenly what did your email emails just started pinging off or what, how, how did it work in, in, in reality? There was a couple of tipping points, but I think that was probably dragged out over a number of years due to my personal circumstances in life and at home at the time. And and if life had been different, they probably would have all compressed down and, and it would have all flipped in a year. Um, I guess my first real break was I did a, a just a solo bike packing trip in the Norwegian fjords uh, in probably 2014 or 15 and I was out there to recce a route for a gold DRV hiking group and so I basically did a four-day walk in two days on the bike and I took a bunch of photos and I wrote a blog and somehow that blog got picked up by some of the bikepacking websites and then it got picked up by Single Track magazine and that then got me in with Alpkit and a, you know, that led on to me helping them with some of their product development and you know, just started to open doors as a, as a supported rider or as a sponsored rider. And I started getting noticed a bit more. And of course, as soon as I started getting that level of additional support, you know, tweets and Instagram posts being liked and retweeted and stuff, um, that then led on to probably 2017 was my biggest year working on the bike and I combined uh, quite a bit of private client work with a lot of work for other people and also some journal journalistic work on and so I spent I spent something like 160 or 180 days sat on the bike being paid for it that year and then did probably another 40 or 50 days just riding for myself that year. Um, and 
that was all by the that was all before the end of end of October actually so I more or less spent like six and a half days a week on my bike for the whole year (laughs) that sounds so good (laughs) it was awesome but I got I got to the end of October I remember I'd run a five-day course for the cadets in North Wales and I'd had a fantastic week and they'd been a great group we'd done some awesome rides and I got off my bike on a Friday afternoon and I threw it muddy and wet and horrible into the back of the van and on Saturday morning I met up with a mate of mine and I sold him my bike <laughs> and, and I didn't have a replacement I didn't have one to, to ride on Sunday I was like I need some time off the saddle yeah <laughs> oh brilliant and as it, so you, you mentioned you've been to Norway uh bikepacking what what are some of the destinations that you've 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 gone to yourself or or that you have taken clients so I've been really lucky over the years. I mean, I've been riding bikes a long time now, but um, I've ridden bikes personally in in New Zealand, in Australia, um, in Canada. I've done quite a lot of riding over there now. Um, and then either taking clients or going and doing trip trips to do as trip reports or as articles for, for magazines. Um, I did a trip across Iceland a few years back that was featured in Single Track magazine. Um, did uh, did a bit of riding in Norway. I worked out in the Middle East for a stint as well. I did three months out in the United Arab Emirates, and we did quite a bit of just really short. They were just two day, one night um, biking trips out there, um, and that was back before you could get any bike packing luggage. So that was in the the joyous days of towing a trailer and having all of the <laughs> headache and drama that comes with it. Yeah. Um, and then yeah, done a bunch of biking, you know, bits and pieces in in France and around Europe. But um, predominantly, I've spent most, you know, 99% of my biking and bike guiding has been in the UK. So I've led groups, done bike packing trips on the Outer Hebrides, on Harris and Lewis, um, all across Northern Scotland, uh, Highlands, right the way down to Dartmoor, Exmoor, South Downs Way. Um, we did a road bike trip around Norfolk a couple of years ago, which was the first time I'd ever been out there. Yeah. Felt like it was so far east, I was about to bump into Russia. <laughs> 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 yeah, so I've been really lucky. My work has taken me all over the UK, so I've had this fantastic exposure to trails and trail centres almost everywhere. There's a bit of a void up in the northeast. Not done. I've never been biking in Kielder, um, and haven't really spent any time in Northumberland and um uh, yeah and, and norfolk was a bit of a hole but otherwise i've i've been pretty lucky got to ride my bike in most of the uk brilliant so you you you, you definitely say that your sort of speciality is more sort of point to point riding as, as it's a journey and there's definitely a journeying aspect there as opposed to the technical um aspects of um of the the trail centers and such I mean, it's it's how much of a role do you think those trail centres have um, and the riding that you do there? How much of a role do they play in those big journeys that you undertake? Trail centres have played a massive role in the industry over the last few years and helping getting people into riding more. Um, and they're, a, they're an incredible resource to get people out biking. You know, the, the last few years, I've done quite a few little bike packing trips around um, Coyd Brennan, you, linking up the, the trail centre there and the Bridleway network. And yeah. there's, a, there's a great little boffy in the woods at Coyd Brennan. Um, so, you know, I've run sort of intro to bike packing courses there quite a bit over the years. And they're a, they're a, known, in, they're a known entity. So you can go and run a course or, um, you know, a skills training session at a trail centre. And you know what you're getting, your clients know what they're getting. You can have a chat with them in advance. And and quite one of my first questions when a new client comes to me is, where do you normally ride? How often do you normally ride there? And how much riding do you normally do? And to date, I've only had that backfire only once where the guys who came misunderstood that trail centres didn't mean bike park Wales. And so so they told me that they did full days of six or seven hours riding reds and blacks, um, you know, most weekends. And when they turned up and I made them pedal up the first hill, they were like, where's the minibus? (laughs) Brilliant. (laughs) Um, 
But the other great thing about trail centers from a guide's point of view and from a, a teaching and learning point of view is that almost nobody ever gets a map out when they're at a trail center. So they've got no idea where they are and you can introduce basic navigation concepts to them so easily by going, oh, you enjoyed that bit. Do you want to go do it again? Well, there's the map. Let's work out how to do it. Yeah. And it can be that first step, that gateway into going, right, well, now you know how to shortcut the, the trail centre or to lap the trail centre or actually to get into the trail centre on a bridle way and to get out on another route. So, yeah, I think they're great. I'm I'm a big fan of them. Yeah, I'm, I'm exactly the same. It's taken, I, I, I came from a background of journeying uh, myself. And so going to the, it does often feel a little bit oh, um, like theme parky at times, but actually you come away with some really cool skills that you've learned and some, um, yeah, there's definitely a really good sense of camaraderie and stuff at, the, at, at, at those as well. And you meet different people and it's, um, yeah, I've really enjoyed trail centers certainly in the last, few years um we we chatted earlier on uh just before we started and um, the call the call um about how uh what sort of a role um adventure has played in in mental health um could, could you I expand on that and and because it's something that you, you you said you'd like to talk about um on on the call so would you like to expand on what we what we talked about yeah, for sure. So I think mental health, um, both my own personal mental health and using adventure to help other people's mental health has played a really central role um, in in my interaction with the industry for years now. Um, uh, quite, quite a few years ago, I, I did a big block of work for the Prince's Trust and we had a, a specialist programme there looking at early intervention of young people who are at particularly high risk of serious mental health and psychosis and that was what really started to open my eyes to reading and researching and understanding the real value and benefit of green spaces and outdoor time and adventure on mental health and also really giving me that first-hand experience of seeing the benefit that it had on you know working with kids who schools and referral agencies would say were absolutely unmanageable you know they were completely off the rails their their mental health challenges were causing such extreme behavior in them that they just couldn't be engaged with at all and i'd take them out mountain biking for the afternoon and they'd be great and they'd have fantastic mm. that is and interact with my experience I, I i'm quite open about my mental health challenges over the years i've certainly written about it for single track a couple of times and on my own blogs and and social media um and there have been some really dark times in my life um you know i was i was married and my partner had uh, my wife had terminal cancer she died in 2016 and that was an extremely challenging time both in, in the run up to her death and in the, the time afterwards. And I'm absolutely certain that it's adventure, probably adventure and friends, are the only things that got me through that period. Um, you know, the the year after Catherine died, I was the year that I went a bit sort of bike crazy and just did everything. Um, but I think my experience of grief and, and depression and anxiety would have been far more volatile, far more dangerous had I not spent that time outdoors. And I was certainly worried, you know, knowing that I was going to have a very dark period to deal with after Catherine died. You know, I had two and a half years notice of that. So I knew that was coming. And I was definitely very concerned about not falling off the rails myself you know not turning into the bottle or not going into a really dark place and and actually you know I was quite frank and open about that conversation with friends and so people just dragged me outdoors and you know I went biking and coasting and canyoning and climbing and everything and that first winter I'm pretty sure I only got through because of people dragging me out um and so now I'm a massive advocate of, of time outdoors. And I think the key things 
for me are if somebody's in a really dark place and is really you know is really stressed or depressed or anxious um just getting outside fresh air and and green space in any form can really be key but choice is stressful and this is something that came from a conversation i had with mike hall years ago um before he sadly um passed away and and it, he was talking about massive massive bike trips and you know riding through the night and i said to him how do you do it at four o'clock in the morning when it's raining you've been awake for 26 hours and you're still pedaling how do you do it and he said oh you just remove choice take choice out of your mindset and the stress goes away and you just keep spinning your legs he said if you choose to not have any option to stop this side of that next climb this side of the next valley if you choose that your only option for you will keep riding and i took that into my my thinking around mental health and just went actually if you're with somebody who's in a dark place don't offer them a cup of tea or a cup of coffee make them a cup of tea and if they don't want it they'll tell you they want coffee and if you know somebody is into the outdoors just turn up on their front door knock on the door and go come on we're going for a walk or we're going for a ride and we're going here and you know you do something low key and easy and super accessible and if you get down onto the seafront on the bikes and they go actually i want to ride something techie and gnarly in the woods you go great let's go up to the woods but what you don't do is just ping them a message and say hey if you want to go ride bikes or get out then let me know because it, it leaves too much choice it leaves too much option and that choice is stressful wow that is a valuable valuable insight really appreciate that and really appreciate you sharing all of that um tom that was um really quite moving um are there any sort of resources that you so someone's um feeling similar um feelings to to the, to, to you um and is in a really sticky situation but they don't have those friends who are going to come around and, and do that necessarily or or aren't in the outdoors aren't involved in that are there, are there any resources that you could point people towards so there's a fantastic um i think it's actually australian um sort of website and, and concept called it's okay to say it's focused around getting predominantly getting men to admit when they're not in a great place um, you know, it's OK to say that you're not OK is, is what that's about. Um, and that really helped me. And then I've really just been gobsmacked at the how how open almost the entire community is to you putting it out there that you're not in a good place. And I guess I was a fairly early adopter of that with being so public, you know, and, and certainly publishing articles where I talked about my mental health and when you look at the comment feed on some of those articles there's just comment after comment after comment of I felt exactly the same I've never been brave enough to speak out or thank you so much for speaking out you know you're not alone I feel the same way um you know I started a little Facebook group years ago you know it's it's sort of it goes through peaks and troughs of people needing it and engaging with it or not but um in that, I just I I added in anybody that I knew who was a bit outdoorsy or a bit open to mental health challenges, and started posting really openly, um, you know, about how I was feeling, and what that did was started a conversation, and everybody was so positive and so responsive to it. Um, I remember one of the posts I put out on social media was. You know, people, when you've gone through something, you know, if, if your partner has died, that's happened to you, everybody knows that you're in a really tough spot. And people will ask you, are you OK? Because, of course, they will. They, they care and they want to show that level of compassion. But they'll ask you, are you OK? At times where you don't want to have that full blown conversation about, no, I'm not OK. I'm falling apart. I'm absolutely in pieces. You know, because you're in the supermarket or you're down the pub with your friends or you're having that five minutes of your day where actually you'd forgotten that your whole world's fallen apart. And so what you end up doing is going, yeah, yeah, I'm OK, shrugging your shoulders. And 
I wrote this out in a post and said, you know, when you ask me that, what I actually want to reply with is, no, I'm not. My world's falling apart, but I don't want to have that whole conversation. And so instead of asking me that, just come up to me and give me a hug. You know, and this was in the glorious days before COVID, where if uh, I, I was really huggy and, and if you weren't one of the huggy ones, then I'm very sorry I imposed myself upon you. But um, yeah, I just said, you know, just just come up to me and you know I'm not OK because what I'm going through, but just come give me a hug. And, and I was in the climbing wall one evening, completely forgotten about this post, completely forgotten about all of what was going on in my life. I was just focused on climbing. And a guy who I'd worked with 10 years before uh, in the Middle East and who I see from time to time, you know, out cragging and stuff. He just walked up to me and wrapped his arms around me. Didn't say anything, just wrapped his arms around me and held me in this hug for a good like 15 or 20 seconds. And I was like, oh, that's a bit odd. That's not, you know, like Tim gives me hugs, but never normally big long ones like this. What's going on? And eventually I relaxed into it and then just had this moment of, ah, okay. This is just Tim going, you know, I know you're not okay, but here you go, have a hug. And he gave me a hug and he was like, oh, what route are you doing? And just went back to being climbers. And that only came from putting myself out there and having that conversation. And do you know what? If if you put yourself out there as having mental health struggles or difficulties and anybody is a dick about it, then the whole world is going to come down on them. So really don't worry about that. The world is full of kind and caring and supportive people who want to give you a hug or want to help you make the day a little bit brighter. That is super cool. I love that. I love that. What a wonderful story. Wonderful. Um, oh, that. I, I, what's the name of your Facebook group? Uh, it's called the Black Dog Dance Club because Black. Um, the Black Dog is generally referred to as somebody's depression. It's. Uh, I think it was a Winston Churchill thing. Right. His little his little black dog followed him around, and some days it was a little terrier, and other days it was a huge great bear that pinned him to the bed and stopped him from getting out. Really nice concept. Lovely. I'll check that out. Brill, um, so we, we mentioned earlier on that you you are a you obviously do your um mountain bike um guiding, but but you're you're also a, a, an avid conservationist and that's where your current role is. So what what is it you you do currently for work? What's your main job now? Yeah, so I'm climate change, green infrastructure and natural flood management officer for the Cluidian Range and Dee Valley area of outstanding natural beauty. So I work for Denbyshire County Council. Yeah. And um, I'm in a strategic role. So I look at policy and um, guidance and reports and bringing together best practice and, um, you know, the, the most current thinking on climate change issues. So carbon capture, carbon reduction, uh, carbon footprint stuff. Um, looking at the impact of climate change on our wild spaces, um, you know, increased drought events, the increased risk of wildfires, um, flooding, water inundation, um, pests, diseases, all that sort of stuff. And then green infrastructure, which is, you know, about making people's homes and work and urban environments greener, um, greener spaces, which as we talked about earlier, you know, we know is good for mental health. We know it's better for health and well-being. And we know that if we invested more money in getting people outdoor and active and, and, and just a little bit outdoor and a little bit active, people don't have to start biking across Iceland. You know, if, if you walk five minutes down the road to Tesco's instead of drive, that sort of outdoor and active has such a massive impact on physical and mental health and well-being that the NHS spending would go down if we invested more in green infrastructure and active travel. Um, and then I also get to, to do a little bit of natural flood management and catchments work. So looking at rivers and water courses and, and that's fantastic because, you know, I've been a paddler for a long time. And so I get to go to some great places. You know, I was looking at doing otter surveys last week and going on to stretches of water and discussing how we can slow the water down when there's massive flood events yeah it's an incredibly varied role and i'm very very lucky to be in it that sounds amazing yeah an otter survey that sounds so good so good so um there's obviously a lot of 
doom and gloom in the in the news about particularly about climate change can you give us some hope here what are you really excited about what really what you where what gives you hope so i've been a climate change activist or campaigner my whole life since before i was riding bikes you know, my mum ran a greenpeace group when i was five or six years old and my earliest memories of being on the campaign store and i have spent my entire life knowing that climate change was happening and, and seeing the science and understanding what was coming down the road but seeing the rest of the world around me carry on oblivious and we are now finally at a point where everyone gets it society gets it government gets it local authority get it you know everybody now knows what climate change is and what is happening and I was sat in a cafe in Dog Ashley a couple of months ago. Um, a little pitch here. I don't get any kickback at all. But if you're ever in Dog Ashley, go to TH Roberts. They do cake that will kill you. It is incredible. <laughs> um, and, and we were sat there having a piece of cake and a cup of coffee. And six just totally standard run-of-the-mill builders came in for their fry-up breakfast. And... You know, the, the kind of guys who stereotypically I'd expect them to start talking about the football or start talking about, you know, their car or just a normal general conversation. But no, they started talking about COP26 and about Greta yeah. Thunberg. Brilliant. And, and, and part of me felt incredibly guilty for prejudging these guys as, you know, sick local builders. Why wouldn't they be interested in climate change? Well, do you know what? Why did I make that assumption? Because I've been part of the climate change world since before it was called climate change, back when it was global warming and acid rain. And that was the first time in my life I'd ever heard a bunch of builders sit down and of their own choice and their own volition start talking about climate change. I'm like, we're finally there. The tipping point, the, the consciousness and the mindset tipping point is there that we now get it. And now it's just a case of feeding that back up the chain and making sure that action is actually taken on the scale that makes meaningful difference. Brilliant. Brilliant. So more conversations are being had. That is brilliant, brilliant news. And it's so nice to hear it. Um, because so I just, I mean, I don't, I don't actively listen to the news a lot, but I have to say whenever there's anything about climate, I'm just, oh man, this is, yeah, it all sounds so dire. So that's really nice to hear a positive, positive story. So um, I want to be respectful um, of your time today, Tom. I've, I've got um, just a few questions just to just to, to close up. Um, so the first question is, what piece of advice would you give you to yourself 10 years ago? So this is going to fly totally in the face of my climate change role, but the... <laughs> the uh, I would say make the most of your working abroad opportunities now. Uh, you know, travel in an environmentally sensitive way, but get on those under 30s work visas for Canada, for New Zealand, for Australia. Get out to Europe and do a season whilst you still can before Brexit totally scuppers you <laughs> and, before you're, and before you're too old to get an easy visa. Brilliant. That is a top tip. Love it. Um, OK, so question number two, what valuable resource, so for example, a book, YouTube channel, piece of equipment, blog, podcast app or other, can you recommend to help others following a similar path? We've obviously already had a few resources. Are there any others? I'm afraid I've got a little bit of a cop out on this one. Um, OK. Because honestly, I think that people need to go and read anything and everything. And I see far too many people in the industry who get all of their knowledge base and information from one group of friends and from one national governing body and from one magazine. And whilst most of that information and content is great and is helping people to become better, safer cyclists and outdoorees, what I don't think it does is develop the critical thought critical thinking that you really need to go really wild really backcountry to be a really good safe leader people need to do is to 
upskill themselves to the point where they can look at look at a situation and assess the risks from a critical analysis point of view and not just do something because they're always told that that is the safe thing to do and you know my I suppose my classic one of this is that for years British Cycling's advice for mountain bike guides and leaders was that you always 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 had to have all members of your group wearing a helmet and wearing gloves but there was no mention in their guidance of wearing glasses eyewear and I worked in central Birmingham at the time and we did lots of mountain bike rides that involved loops on the canals and most of the water that was on those canal tow paths you didn't want in your mouth or in your eyes and I also worked with a load of Sikh kids who couldn't wear helmets and so if I followed British Cycling guidance I never took those kids on bikes and what I did do was take the other kids on canal tow paths where they got horrible mucky water in their eyes and then the, the ride finished 10 minutes in and so by looking at it from a more critical point of view I'd go right we've got a load of seat kids they can't wear helmets but they really want to engage in biking so how do we do a cycling event for them that is safe enough for them to engage in without wearing helmets and so we would just change the venue and we would change the training and we would upskill them loads before they ever got to the point of being able to have a high speed or dangerous enough impact that they would receive a head injury from it but you never get to that point unless you take information from the broadest spectrum of places available to you and develop that real critical thinking. Brilliant. That doesn't sound like a cop out at all. That sounds very valuable, valuable indeed. Um, so the, the, the final question, uh, what would you like to see change about the adventure and outdoors industry? Pay and working conditions and equity of access to become an outdoor instructor. Um, whilst pay and working conditions has improved, um, I don't, I can't objectively say whether it's improved across the board because my skill level has gone up and so I get better paying work off better clients now. But I do still see work being offered that when you break it down and you look at how many hours you're doing, working for that customer, you're getting paid less than minimum wage. And that's not only is it not acceptable, but it's also not safe. And we have seen examples in the past of people driving far too tired because they're having to go from one job to the next. I know countless freelancers who work seven days a week for six months straight through the summer. And that's not safe. And we need to just have fairer pay scale, recognising people's skills and contributions and safe working hours. Too many times have I been asked to do 16 or 18 hour days for a client and you can't do an 18 hour day back to back whilst you're physically active and still be safe. So I think that really needs to change. And I think we need to look at ways of breaking down the barriers, the, the actual barriers that are really stopping people from a diverse range of backgrounds from getting into uh, outdoor adventure participation and leadership and I think we've done a lot of work around breaking down barriers for getting women into the outdoor industry but my concern is that there's still a whole swathe of people who are being missed and I certainly know there's some young lads from really deprived backgrounds who have just not been able to get into the industry because they've not been able to bankroll it themselves and there's been no grant money available to help them because they're blokes um, and we are still an incredibly white, um, probably I'd go as far as say white middle class um, industry. Mm. So uh, how does that look in, in reality, Tom? How, how, how are we going to how are we going to address that? Do you think some, some sort of practical steps? Yeah, I think we need to take outdoor adventure to to a wider, diverse range of communities, um, you know, I, I certainly worked with a lot of kids when I was in Birmingham. We had a, a big black community, a big Asian community and a big white community. And within about six months of starting working with them on bike trips, I realized that we were getting all the black kids and all the white kids coming on the bike trip, but none of the Asian kids. And I couldn't understand why, because they came climbing, they came paddling, they did other stuff. Mm. And I dug down into it and realized the reason why is because 
generally speaking, and it's a massive generalization, but generally speaking, white families buy kids for bikes and teach kids to ride bikes. And generally speaking, the Asian families that we were engaging with didn't. So we were working with 15 year old kids who'd never been on a bike before. And once we realized that and identified it, and we went, right, well, the solution is we teach, teach them how to ride a bike. And mm. it's incredible, the progression. You know, you put an adult onto a bike for the first time ever, and four weeks later, you can take the mountain bike in a canic chase. You know, it doesn't take years, but it just takes a slightly different look at it, a different perspective. Um, and then I think we seriously need to deal with the, the massive issues we've got around access. Um, access to outdoor spaces you know and as as a couple of bikers talking to each other about this that's going to be the particular bugbear but we have got so many dead-ended bridleways we have got so little legal mountain biking you know snowdonia national park has probably got 12 days worth of legal mountain biking in mm. and that's it all the rest of the stuff is off piste so as a guide you can't take people there and as a local if you don't have the money to drive out you don't have trails on your doorstep. So we really need to link up the, the bridleway network and we really need to break down the barriers for adaptive equipment for disabled people. So many trails are not wide enough to get a, a trike or a wheelchair down them, not for any good reason other than crap tra trail design or being overgrown. And, mm. you know, why are we still putting kissing gates and styles into the outdoor, uh, you know, into the rural community? They serve no purpose. Just put a self-closing pedestrian gate and then somebody on crutches, somebody a limited mobility, somebody with a guide dog, somebody in a, in a, in a wheelchair, an off-road wheelchair can then get through it and get access to it. And then they can build up their experience level and then they can potentially become instructors. Absolutely brilliant. Very well said. Yeah, I couldn't, couldn't agree more. Brilliant. Um, just, to, just to close out then, uh, Tom, uh, where, where can people find out more, more about you and, and what you're up to? So I'm not particularly prolific on on social media. I find it uh, hammers my mental health because I just feel like I'm never doing a good enough job of posting compared to all of the other <laughs> uh, all the other adventure leaders out there who've got these incredible photos going up all the time. But if you're uh, prepared to take a mediocre Instagram account, then I'm on there at carbon.monkey. Um, you can also find me on Facebook at The Carbon Monkey. Um, you can't find my website at the moment because it's down. Um, we're, I'm going to do a total new new overhaul on that to better reflect the, the sort of work that I'm doing now and a broader range of my interests. So, yeah, catch me on social media. And by all means, ping me a direct message. And uh, I'm always keen to chat. Cool. Well, thanks ever so much again, Tom. And uh, it's been an absolute pleasure talking with you. And uh, hopefully... Maybe a little bit further down the line, we could do a round two. And uh, best of luck with everything. Excellent. Thanks very much for having me, Tom. Cheers. Cheers, Tom. Bye. Cheers. If you've enjoyed this podcast and want to hear the next one, please subscribe. Please share the podcast with your friends and followers. You can also find the Adventure Pro podcast on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Adventure Pro Pod.